It's not very often a video game leaves you a snivelling wreck, at least not in the first 30 minutes of gameplay. Once that title appears on screen, chances are you're curled up in a ball, weeping uncontrollably, or you simply have no soul. By the time you reach the title card of The Last of Us, you knew you were in for something special. Taking players on a journey of desperation, survival, and ultimately love, Naughty Dog's 2013 masterpiece ushered in a new era of cinematic storytelling, reinforcing the idea that moving, powerful storytelling can be achieved from a medium that's widely misconstrued as just something you can kill people in. I mean, you do kill things in The Last of Us, but that's not the point. Development lasted four years, and even after the critical acclaim and constant regards to it as being one of the best games of all time, there are still a few things I don't think you know about The Last of Us. I'm Rich from WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 mind-blowing facts you never knew about The Last of Us. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to stay notified. Ding. Ding. Done. Number 10. Neil Druckmann originally wanted to write comics. Creative director of The Last of Us, Neil Druckmann was a huge fan of comic books growing up, so much so it inspired him to go into writing in the first place. At one point he was keen to write a novel, but wasn't entirely sure how to go about it. After devouring the work of the legendary Brian Michael Bendis, he came across Robert McKee's book, Story, which is essentially a screenwriter's bible. Druckmann's discovery of this book was a major turning point for him in terms of writing, and helped him hone the skills he then put to pretty good use on The Last of Us. Number 9. It was going to be a Jack and Daxter reboot. After Naughty Dog's success with Uncharted 2, Naughty Dog split into two teams. One began development on Uncharted 3, whilst the other team, led by Druckmann, began development on rebooting the Jack and Daxter series. Drux and co looked to Uncharted 2 for inspiration on where to begin. As production went on, it felt like this title was very much a different beast, and slapping the Jack and Daxter brand on it would be a disservice to the fans of the series since there was next to no resemblance to the originals. In the end, Druckmann and his ensemble went to the higher-ups of Naughty Dog and got the green light to make whatever they wanted. Number 8. The gameplay came from brainstorming sessions for Uncharted 2. While Naughty Dog were still one big team in developing Uncharted 2, Neil Druckmann and game director Bruce Straley would brainstorm various concepts for the game, one of which they referred to as The Mute Girl. This concept played out as follows. Drake was in a city during a civil war, and he had joined a group of rebel fighters. At night he was awoken by his companion, a young girl who couldn't speak. They would travel across buildings and rooftops together, communicating via actions during gameplay. Druckmann wanted to explore how these characters would develop an unbreakable bond together through these shared experiences rather than just through dialogue alone. Sound familiar? Number 7. It was inspired by more than just zombies. The Last of Us was inspired by many sources, such as movies, documentaries, and books. Beyond the rather obvious The Walking Dead influences, there is the ever-present concept of environmental deterioration in a depopulated world. This was a subject covered in The World Without Us by Alan Weissman, which depicts a scenario where towns and cities are overrun by forests and vegetation after humanity's extinction. Other literary inspiration includes Polio, an American story by David Ashinsky, and City of Thieves by David Binioff, the former influencing Naughty Dog's disease populace, and the latter influencing the strong bonds formed between two survivors in an oppressive environment. Film influences include The Road and No Country for Old Men, the latter providing insight into their use of a low-key soundtrack to convey tension. Number 6. It was pitched to George Romero. Despite The Last of Us escaping the now rather dull classification of just another zombie game, originally the distinction was much clearer. Rewind to 2004, Neil Druckmann was still attending Carnegie Mellon University. He and his class were tasked by his professor to devise a video game concept that would be pitched to no other than George Romero. Druckmann's concept involved a cop who had a heart condition flung into a world inspired by Romero's own Night of the Living Dead, where he would protect a young girl against the hordes. Romero passed, but the idea stuck, something Druckmann was planning to revisit in a comic called The Turning. Number 5. It was initially, and unintentionally, sexist. No surprises that The Last of Us went through many changes throughout development based on what you've seen so far. One concept was almost identical to the masterpiece we know now, except it was a bit more of a, let's say, sausage fest. In this variation of the plot, the virus attacks as we know, but it only affects women. So, you and Ellie, still a young girl and still somehow immune to the virus, would play through the game essentially as normal, with Ellie still ending up on the operating table trying to work out how she was immune. Of course, due to the virus only affecting women, you'd be up against lots and lots of zombie women, and only zombie women. This concept was quite thankfully scrapped, as a female employee at Naughty Dog pointed out to Druckmann that having only women become the monsters and be shot to pieces probably wasn't the best idea. Number 4. The comic prequel influenced the game. 
Writing on the prequel comic American Dreams began while The Last of Us was still in development, so all sorts of nods and references found their way into the game. Ellie's favourite video game character, Angel Knives, was actually created by the prequel comic's artist and co-writer, Faith Erin Hicks, whose artwork appears in Game on the Turning Arcade Machine, which in itself is a reference to Druckmann's scrapped comic book idea. Ashley Johnson, the voice of Ellie, read the comic prequel before reprising her role in Left Behind, something the voice of Riley, Yanni King, also did. Druckmann wanted to explore more of Ellie's backstory in the main game, but he felt it disturbed the natural flow of the narrative. When the prequel comic opportunity arose, he jumped at the idea, hence the inclusion of the origin of Ellie's Switchblade and her mother's letter. Number 3. The truck cinematic was the first scene captured. Not only was it the first scene to be mocapped for the game, in its original form it was slightly different. When she picks up the magazine, Ellie was originally going to say, how does she walk around with those things? The character Bill's sexual orientation wasn't established at this point in development, so Ellie picks up a magazine with, let's say, well-endowed women brandished across the pages. Druckmann thought more of Bill's character and what he brought to the narrative. He came to the conclusion that if Joel is what happens when you risk everything you care about, even if it means dooming the world, Bill is the flip side of that. He's the character cut off from the outside world, someone who's lost someone he deeply cares about. What if Bill's late partner was more than just a friend? The now inconsistent magazine in the scene was pointed out by one of the animators, and the scene was reshot with new dialogue. Number 2. Tess was originally the villain. The first part of The Last of Us would have played out in the same way as the finished version, up until the group reached a security checkpoint at which Ellie's infection would be discovered, prompting Joel to kill the guards and escape with Ellie. Tess, feeling betrayed by Joel, tracked Joel across the country in search of Ellie. Tess would have eventually caught up with Joel in an old ranch house, where Joel holds her off so Ellie can escape. Tess proceeds to torture Joel for information regarding Ellie's whereabouts, and just as she's about to paint the walls with Joel's brain goo, Ellie arrives and shoots Tess. Our duo would then leave for San Francisco and rebuild their lives there. It would have been an entirely new journey for our characters compared to the release narrative, but Druckmann scrapped the idea as he felt it didn't feel honest to the characters. Number 1. The prologue scene was the toughest day of Troy Baker's career. Shooting a scene that ends with the death of a child isn't easy, no surprises there, more so when you have to do 8 or 9 takes. It doesn't get any easier. When it came time to shoot Sarah's death in the prologue, Troy Baker gave it his all. He then described it as the second worst day of his life, the first being the day from which he drew the emotion to actually play the scene. After a truly daunting performance, Druckmann requested another take. Baker, emotionally battered and confused, agreed. Druckmann wanted a more subdued performance in this scene, making the narrative moment hit home even harder when the brash theatrics take a back seat. Once Druckmann got the take he wanted, he crafted one of the most poignant moments in video game storytelling, and one of the most emotionally wrenching scenes in the medium. Baker, understanding his reasons, later called Druckmann the best director he had ever worked with. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe below, and if you're looking for more content like this, then try a few things that are floating about around my ears. It might be fun. I can't promise it though. But it might be.